have something on my mind. I want to talk about more than one piece of data today. So welcome back. Can you guys hear me in back? OK, great. So today we're going to dramatically expand our ability to work with data in Java. So up to this point, what we've seen this semester is an ability to store and manipulate and also make decisions based on data. But only to this point we've worked with single data values. And when you think about the world around us, there's not a lot out there that we can represent with single pieces of data. Usually when we talk about data, we're talking about data in the plural. And today, we're gonna talk about a way in Java to start working with data plural, multiple data values. And we're gonna start bringing some structure to that data in a way that does actually represent real world data around us. So the um, data structures, and the programming constructs that we're gonna talk about today would actually allow you to start working with data like music, for example, or temperature series data, or a variety of different regularly sampled or regularly occurring data in the world, right? So this is kind of exciting. So we've talked about data, so this is sort of where we are, right? We talked about basic math and simple decision making, and today these are the two things that we're gonna focus on. We're gonna start out talking about how do we store more than one data value? And at the beginning, our consideration that this is gonna be pretty limited. We're gonna talk about how to store multiple values of the same type. Later in the semester, so this is one of our big sort of jumps in terms of our ability to work with data, is working with multiple values. Later in the semester, we'll actually start to talk, when we talk about objects, we'll talk about ways to work with mixtures of different types of data that might represent an entity in the real world. But for now, we're gonna talk about multiple data values, right? And again, this is exciting because, you know, a lot of things in the world can't be represented by a single value, right? Java's primitive types that we've introduced up to this point um, have allowed us to represent single numbers. Essentially, anything that you can represent is a number. And then a few things like true and false, that we have a convention about what numbers represent true, what number represents true, and what number represents false. And then things like characters, where again, we apply another convention so that we can store internally. If you look inside the computer, what's actually being stored when you store a character value in Java, it's a number. And then we have this agreement that we've all come up with about when you print that number as part of the display, what is actually shown. And so last day, a couple classes ago, I showed you the ASCII table. Uh, now we have a much more complicated and larger standard called Unicode that allows us to uh, so we've agreed on, for example, numbers that represent various types of emoji, or Chinese characters, or various characters in, you know, some even ancient scripts that, you know, people don't even use anymore, but you can represent in Unicode. So we went from being able to represent, like, 256 characters, and now we can represent billions, right? And that's dramatically expanded our ability to work with text. But again, what about if we want to work with multiple values? So the thing I was just talking about, text, it's not very useful if you can only store one character, right? Like one character from a book doesn't tell very much of a story, right? Um, one number, if you think about the stories we tell with data, right? One measurement of temperature doesn't tell a story, right? Um, to tell one, you know, uh, the measurement of sound pressure at one point at one time doesn't tell a story. It doesn't sing a song. In order to do that, we need to expand our repertoire. So I've given you some hints, right? So what are the, some of the things? Now again, I'm gonna limit you to thinking about multiple values of the primitive types, okay? Um, but can we think about some different ways that we could represent data around us using multiple values of these primitive types? So text is one of the most obvious ones. What you're looking at on the screen, right? So I could take every sentence on this, on this slide and I can digitize it. It's the process of converting it into information that a computer can use. The way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna, one way to do it is to take my ASCII table and look up what's the number for C, right? Capital C, that's my first number. Then I look up what's the number for a lowercase a. That's my second number. And I keep doing that, and I can essentially take all of this and reduce it to a series of characters. The spaces, if I wanna get fancy and I wanna use something like Unicode, I can represent the bullets. Um, so this entire thing can be digitized. This is the process of taking something in the world and converting it into a format that a computer can work with. 
And almost always when we talk about doing that, what we're talking about is converting it into a sequence of numbers, okay? So internally, the computer is gonna store a sequence of numbers. So again, the computer that is displaying this slide has no idea um, what is up on the screen or what it means. All it knows is that internally, somewhere in the computer's memory or somewhere in, on your computer right now, if you're looking at this slide, there is a sequence of numbers, you know, capital T, you know, for the start of text, a small case E is the next number that are stored there. And when the slide is rendered or displayed to your screen, those numbers are used by the computer to figure out which letters to display. Again, think about it. the computer to understand what text is. To it, it's just like, okay, well, you gave me the number 138. I looked that up in my table, and I pull out this uh, thing that looks like one line with another line across it. And that's what I put up there. That's what you told me to do, right? But that's how this is, that's how this is represented internally. So anything we can represent with text, we can clearly represent in the computer, so DNA, right? When you guys look at, D, if you guys work with DNA or, or if you've learned about DNA, uh, if you've learned there's like four base pairs, right? Um, but that's actually a way that humans have taken DNA and converted into text. But if you store DNA in a computer, you would just store each one of those base pairs as a single number. And you could probably even use a short for this or a byte because there's only four base pairs for DNA, right? Um, any time series data in the world. So what do we mean by time series data? This is data that's produced by regularly measuring something over and over and over again in time. So time is going by and I'm measuring something about the world. I might measure temperature at a particular point every day, every hour, right? When you graph that out and you collect that data um, and use a computer to visualize it, you can see trends, right? I might take, um, if I'm recording audio, how does that work? I have this sensor called a microphone that measures the, s the pressure in the air at a particular point. And I measure that many, 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 many times, really fast. It's like 32,000 times per second. I measure that. And what I can do is I can then write down all those numbers in my computer, and I can turn that data back around and use it to reproduce the same sound, the same series of pressure measurements. When I produce those through a speaker, you recognize as the sound that you recorded. This is how sound recording works. If you have it on your phone, if you have a little sound recorder, when you turn it on, the computer's sitting down there writing number, 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 really, really fast, and those numbers are the measurement of the sound, the air pressure, at the microphone that you have on your, uh, on your, uh, on your phone or whatever recording device you're using. And again, so I'll just point this out. Music is a series of pressure messages. So it's one of my favorite types of, of uh, data, if you haven't noticed that already. So again, this is really dramatically all of these types of information are, we can represent by a single series of the same type of data, right? Uh, text, we use characters. So we use a bunch of characters laid end to end. DNA, we could use characters or we could re-represent the DNA using a different representation. We could decide that what we call adenine is zero. What we call thymine is one. Anyone know the names of these? Did I just make those up or am I actually accurately remembering college biology from 20 years ago? I don't know what the other two are. Cytosine? And then what's the last one? Guan, I know. That's the weird one, right? Sounds like Guam. Um, all right. Anyway, at some point I had to know those, but now I'm getting a straight C, three out of four. Um, Okay, so, you know, and, and again, all of these, this is all data that now today we're gonna be able to start thinking about working with, right? So how are we gonna do that in Java? We're gonna introduce a new way to store data. This is a new type of variable. The variables we've looked at so far store single values. You can't store more, if you uh, initialize a variable of type int, you get to put one number in there, that's it. If we wanna store more than one int, we have to create a new type of variable. And we refer to this category of variables as an array. Arrays store zero, you can have an empty array, it's not always that useful, but zero or more values of the same type. So I can create an array of ints, at which point I can store more than one int. I can create an array of characters, at which point I can store more than one character. So I, I don't want this to go unnoticed by you. 
because many of you will go on and you'll take this course called CS225 and a couple semesters, data structures, and you'll be like, I'm learning data structures. No, you're learning data structures today. Arrays are a data structure. And if you can't understand how arrays structure data, you're gonna have a harder time with, you know, all the fancy stuff you learned at 225, like B trees and all that, that stuff, okay? So every data structure does what its name sounds like, brings structure to data. So it takes data that might be out there in the world, and it structures it in some way. And in so doing, it also associates new data, sometimes we refer to as metadata, with the original data, okay? And actually, arrays are a great chance to talk about this. So arrays put the values inside of them in an order. And that order is meaningful. Again, think about temperature measurements for a particular point in time. If you take those, and you scramble them up in time, it's meaningless. It's just noise. There's no uh, use in looking at the data that way. Same thing with sound. If you take all of the numbers that constitute that great little kid song I just played for you right before class, right? If you take all the numbers, millions of numbers that represent that song, and you just throw them in any order, and you play that back, you know what it's gonna sound like? Shh. It's just noise, okay? The order matters. Order is what makes that sound beautiful and inspiring, right? Order is what allows us to see trends, right? Putting things in the right order. Arrays take data inside them and they establish an ordering, right? Same thing with text. Imagine I took all the letters inside War and Peace and just scrambled them up and I was like, here's the book. It's all the same data, right? Every letter that was in War and Peace is in there. But if they're not in the right order, it's meaningless. So once we create an array, every value inside the array, so we talk about data, so an array has data inside of it, but arrays also establish metadata. Once I put items in order, not only do I have the data I started with, but I can tell you where the data is in the array. That's another piece of information, it's called metadata, right? The index in the array that contains that position, right? Okay, we're gonna play with these in a minute, obviously, but let's look, first of all, at how we declare them in Java, all right? And I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm contrasting for you the declaration of a single data value, which we talked about previously, and an array. So on line two here, I'm declaring a single data value, right? This tells Java, I am going to store a single integer, and I'm gonna use the name single. That's a meaningful name for me. On line four, we see this new syntax. So I see a pair of square brackets there next to the type. This tells Java multiple is going to store an array of integers, not just one, but multiple, okay? So I'm taking data and I'm putting it in order. We'll talk about the size in a minute, okay? This is the declaration of the type. Because in Java, we distinguish between the type of a variable that stores one value and one value only, like single, and the type of variable that can store zero or more values of the same type, multiple. Same thing down here, okay? The difference here is this pair of square brackets. That's what tells Java that you are declaring to Java that this variable called all is going to store an array of characters, okay? Put item, multiple characters in there. So you might wonder, how do I tell Java how big the array should be? So now we're gonna talk about how we initialize an array. So in Java, a variable that, that has an array type can refer to any an array that has any number of values. But just like we did, well, it's a little bit different than, than when we use single values, so there's some new syntax here. So let's look at it carefully. Okay, there's actually some new syntax here. <laughs> um, all right, so on line two, let's look at what's happening. On the left side, this looks similar to what we just saw, right? Which is that I'm saying, I'm creating a variable called multiple. That variable stores not just one int, but because I have those square brackets there, this variable is gonna store multiple integer values. Now on the right side, I have an assignment. Just like we did with single values, there are multiple different ways to assign a value to an array in Java, to an array type. This is one of them, okay? What I'm doing here I see this new keyword, okay? So this is a part of the Java language. This is required. 
This tells Java, create a new array of integers, and that thing inside there, that number eight, that's the size. Okay, so it's a little confusing. You might think maybe eight is one of the values I'm putting in there. No, this is, and actually, if you're coming from Python, it's really confusing, right? Because in Python, you can uh, declare a list using square brackets, and you put the values you want in the list inside. In Java, this is different. So in Java, this says, I'm creating an empty array of integers of size eight. Now, arrays in Java, we're talking about them now. Um, they, they have these, a couple of, there's a couple of weird things about them that aren't gonna make sense to us for a couple of weeks, okay? So this new keyword is one of them. The other thing about arrays that's not gonna make sense, and it will make sense, and I will come back and explain why this is the case, is arrays have a property called length. So once I have an array variable, if I wanna know how big it is, I can print the value of the name of the array dot length, okay? You have to trust me on this. We'll look at this in a minute, we'll do this together. This is really important because at the end of today's class, at the second half, we're gonna talk about going through how do we process arrays using a new programming construct called a loop. And this is gonna be really important for allowing us to figure out how many times our loop should execute, all right? But for now, again, just sort of like trust me that this works. And, and we'll play with it, we'll, we'll see for ourselves. I can also obviously split, like I did with variables, I can split the declaration of an array with its assignment. So here I declare a variable called all that's in the score and array of characters, and here I'm uh, initializing, or I'm assigning all the value of an empty array of size four, okay? Again, the thing inside here is not a, a, a uh, item that's in the array, it's the size, okay? You might wonder, can I initialize an array with a literal? And the answer is yes, here's how you do it. Again, sorry if you're coming from Python. This is similar to Python, but different enough that it's gonna confuse you, okay? Um, in Java, if I want to initialize an array, and I, uh, let's say I know the values that I want to have in my array, I can say, here's my variable declaration. I'm declaring a variable called multiple. It's gonna store an array of integers, and over here, in curly braces, not square brackets, curly brackets, I put the values that I want separated by commas. Why, so there's something that's different here compared with this declaration. What's missing from the declaration and assignment on line two? What don't I have to tell Java in this case? Yeah. Yeah, so I don't see a size here, and why don't I have to do that? You know the answer to this? Because it knows. So essentially what'll happen is it'll count the number of elements in my initializer and that's the size array I get. So here multiple is gonna be initialized to an array of size four. Here awesome is gonna be initialized to an array of size three. These are character values, okay? All right. So again, I don't have to specify the size because Java can figure it out for me. Okay. I promise we're gonna get to a playground soon. Just gotta get some syntax out of the way and then we'll give you guys a chance to mess around a little bit. Um, so now the question is, now that I have these, these uh, items that are in order, what if I wanna get at the order? I wanna, I wanna access the first item or the third item or the tenth item, how do I do that? So I use something called bracket syntax in Java. Again, this, in Python, this is actually similar, um, but you know, so you guys may have seen this already. So here's my array declaration initialization. After line one finishes executing, I have an array called twos that will store three integers. Now, what this does, and some, for some of you, this is gonna trip you up for a while, right? I'm just gonna warn you. This will access the first element of twos. So if I take an array and I want to access an element, I put the index of the element inside a pair of square brackets and have it follow the name of the array. So this will retrieve the first value of my twos array. Now what's confusing about this for some people is that I'm using the number zero. Zero is, turns out, is actually the first number. I'm sorry that your grade school teachers lied to you. 
Maybe they didn't. How many, does, did anyone actually, was anyone actually taught that zero was like the first number? It's all work to do. My mom is very like, she's very militant about this. And my sister just had a baby and like her big goal, get, the baby's like one month old, right? But my mom's big goal is making sure that the baby understands zero, right? That's like a, it's high on her list of things to do as a parent, as a grandparent. Anyway, uh, so maybe in 20 years, the answer to that question will be different. But as computer scientists, we start counting at zero. The first element in an array has index zero. The second one has index one. The third one has index two. Just get used to that. That's why last Wednesday was class zero. That's why last week was quiz zero. This is quiz one. That's how we count. That's how you count as a computer scientist now. You know, this will help you fit in. Count starting at zero. So this retrieves the value, the first value in the array, which is one. This is the order of my values. I can also modify values in the array. So this is an assignment. This says assign two as the first element in the twos array. So after I do that, I've modified the array. I used to have one as the first element, now I have two. And I can also access the last element, or ele the third element here, using the index two. Trust me, this becomes like totally second nature. Um, so again, you know, so I just want to point out again that what you're seeing here on this slide is both the data. The data in this array initially is the values 1, 2, and 4. The metadata are the values 0, 1, and 2. Those are the indexes of those items in the array. So when I declare and initialize this array, what I'm saying is that I'm associating the index 0 with the value 1, the index 1 with the value 2, the index 2 with the value so this is one of our first examples of metadata, right? So data structures put items in order. As part of doing that, they associate an index with each element in the array. The indexes start from zero, and they go up into the size of the array minus one. So if the array has 10 elements, valid indexes are zero through nine. If the array has 52 elements, valid indexes are zero through 51. If you count carefully, you'll see that that's 51. 52 elements. All right. So let's do, actually, sorry. Let's, I, I think we have a, a playground coming up. Any questions about the syntax here uh, before we start to see what to do with these guys? We will, uh, we will do one of these examples in a minute. Any questions about syntax? Yeah. So to be honest, I don't know exactly what Python's concept of an array is. Right? When I talk about arrays in Python, I'm really thinking about lists. Right? Um, so the question is, can you? Mo in, in, and I think you're, you're, you're raising an interesting question. We're going to come back and talk about that in a minute. Right? In in uh, Java, once I declare an array, I can modify its contents anytime I want. There is something about this array that I cannot change. And if you're coming from Python, it's something that you're used to being able to change. And that is the size. So once I create this twos array here, if I want to add a new item to it, I can't. I can modify items, but I can't change the size of twos from three to four. Or at least I can't do it in the way that you guys might be used to in Python, where it's like I just call a function like add or something like that. And then it adds it to the end or to the beginning or in the middle somewhere. Right? Um, Java arrays don't let you do that. There is a data structure in Java that will allow you to do that that behaves more like a Python list, and we will get there in about a month. Okay, but this is, this, we'll, I'll come back and talk about this. Episode. Okay. Other questions about arrays before we move on and talk about what to do with them, right? All right, so the, the, the goal of talking about this, this data structure, this new way of storing data, um, well, actually, I shouldn't say this. This data structure really dramatically expands our ability to work with data in Java. So that's awesome, okay? But now, we typically want to do something with the data inside the array. We want to be able to process it, or access it, or display it, or whatever. Imagine I'm graphing some data. I need to go through every data item and do something with it so that it appears on the screen. 
Imagine I'm playing a song. I'm going through that MP3 file or the stream that you're getting from the internet somewhere, and I'm taking all those samples, and very carefully, at the exact right time, I'm sending them to the speaker on your computer or to your headphones or whatever, right? So they arrive at your ears at the right time. This brings us to one of the other computer capabilities that we talked about that's basic and fundamental, which is the ability to do things over and over again extremely quickly. And not just the simple things we've been talking about so far, but an ability to repeat operations. All right, so this brings us to the new programming construct. So the first half of today, we talked about a new data structure and a new type in Java. The second half, we're pairing that with a new programming construct. So this is the way to get your Java programs to repeat, this really is tiresome, um, to repeat operations over and over again. Right, this is something called a loop. A loop is a way of telling the computer, I want you to repeat some series of instructions, some part of my program. I want to execute multiple times. So, and this is a common way of working with data in arrays. So a lot of times what we're gonna do is we're gonna take an array, we're gonna have data in it, and then we're gonna go value by value through that array, and we're gonna do something to it. You guys will have some experience doing this in some of our homework problems and labs coming up. So for example, you guys will encrypt some data. So you'll take some strings, and you'll go through character by character, and you'll apply a transformation so that the output is garbled. It's hard to read. And then you can reverse the transformation. You can take that secret message. It's not very secret. Um, it's very easy to break, but there are better ways of doing it, and decrypt it so you can actually read it. Right? This is an example of taking an array of data and processing it by looking at the values one at a time. But in order to do that, we want to repeat a set of steps over and over again. In order to do that, we need these types of constructs. Okay, so this is our first loop. It is not that complicated, uh, but it's some new syntax for us. So let's start looking at it on line one. So this part might look familiar. I've got an open curly brace and a closed curly brace, and inside I have a block of code. Where did we see this before? Last time, this is part of what statement that we learned on Monday? If, if else. So if else established the idea of a block of code. We're gonna reuse that idea when we talk about loops. So these loops will, ex will allow you to say, this block of code should be executed over and over and over again. The simplest version of this is something called a while loop, okay? So here's my keyword, and again, like the other things we've looked at, these keywords are special in the Java language, so you can't create a variable called while with the name while. It won't let you, because while is used to start a loop. While loops start with the keyword while, and then in these parentheses, I have a condition that needs to be true for the loop to continue to execute. This is a conditional expression. I can use all the conditional expressions I talked about last time as part of my if-else statements inside my while loop. So what happens is I get to the while loop and Java says, is this condition true? If the condition is true, it will run the block of code. It will then go back to the top of the loop and say, is the condition true? If the condition is true, it'll run the block of code. So this loop is not that useful because it will never stop. There's no way, to, well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, the, this loop will not stop because the condition is false. There are other ways to get out of a loop that we'll look at in a minute. All right, so. The while loop has two parts. So the, the second part is the block of code that we actually want to execute multiple times. And the first part is a condition that's going to be checked every time I enter the loop. As soon as that condition becomes false, Java will not enter the loop again. It'll drop below the block of code that you told it to repeat and continue to execute the rest of your program. All right, so finally, all right, so let's look at this. You have a chance to, to play a little bit. So here's an example of a while loop. Here I'm using a little bit more of an interesting condition, potentially useful. So on line one, let's go through this code together. So on line one, I'm declaring a variable called index. The type of that variable is int, and I'm assigning an initial value zero. Now I have my while loop. So there's two parts to the while loop. There's the block of code that I'm gonna repeat. As usual, that block of code is indented to the right to help me identify it when I'm reading my program. So that block of code consists of two statements. 
The first one is printing the value of index. Remember, I can access index because index has been declared outside of this block, right? So remember, variables at the same level or to the left, I can access uh, in this block. And then index plus plus. And I'm not even sure we've seen this, but what do you guys think this does? A couple different ways to write this. This increments index. So after index plus plus, after line four runs, the first time through index is zero, and then after line four executes, it becomes one. The second time I execute the block of code, it's two, three, four. So finally, so the first time I come through, index is zero. Is zero less than four? Yes, so this is true, I enter the loop. Now, the second time I get to the condition, what's the value of index? because I incremented it on line four. Is it one less than four? It is, so I keep going. Eventually, index is going to get to what value that's gonna cause the loop to stop? Four. As soon as index becomes four, this condition is no longer true because four is not less than four. It's not strictly less than four. Then, I'm gonna execute this line of code. Which I was gonna say, okay, I'm done with the loop. You told me to repeat something, I repeated it, we're good and I'm gonna get down to line six, and the program will finish. So let's run this and see what happens. Okay. So I see the values zero, one, two, and three were printed. Those were printed inside the loop by line three. Then what happened is index became four, got to the top, condition no longer true, dropped to the bottom, hit the done. Questions about this? brings together a couple new things. There's a while loop, there's a conditional expression, there's a block of code. Is a good time to ask questions? Is that one in the back? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, what is index plus plus? Let me write this a different way for you. There's a couple of other ways I can write this. Does that help? So this is a modification, or I can also write it this way. Those are all the same. So incrementing a variable by one is so common in Java that we have a shorthand for it, which is plus plus. You'll see that a lot. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. So great question. That's one of these little bits of Python, uh, py Python syntax. Here. So actually, let's let's do that because I know we didn't have a playground. So let's create. Um, Let's create an array with these values. And actually, how about we do this? Let's actually print values i, and then, oops, sorry, values index. Oh, Chuck Stiles angry with me. All right. Oh, okay. So now, now we change it up a little bit, right? So let's slow down, look at this again. So now on line two, I've declared an array of integers called values. And I use that curly bracket syntax to, um, to initialize that to the values one, three, and five. So one now has index zero, two now has index one, and five now has index two. Now I go through my while loop, and what am I doing? So before, and this is important, right? I can use a literal as an index, right? So this just repeatedly prints the first value in the array. But I can also use a variable as an index. You see this a lot. So now what I'm doing is I'm pulling values out of my array one at a time, and I print it. So the question was, in Python, so in Java I can do things like this, so let's, the, let's change that to two. You'll see that that's reflected in my loop. Python allows you to do these nice things like this. No way, <laughs> not gonna happen in Java. So, uh, but this is a great uh, chance for us to see what happens when we try to use an invalid index, okay? so. You'll, you'll see there was a, a problem, and we're gonna come back and talk about this a little bit more in a couple of classes, but um, when my program ran, it actually crashed. This would cause like, is that, have you guys ever had an app on your phone crash, where it says like, sorry, this app has stopped responding or whatever, and you get to kill it? Or maybe it actually said like it crashed, you know, and it, you know, so this is, this is the equivalent of that. This is not good. You do not want this to happen. So, um, who can give me another value here that will cause this to crash, since we're having fun with crashes? Four, yeah, let's look at four. This is a con, well actually, you know what? Hold on, 
this one's better, okay? And I'm sure some of you are gonna see this error message and it's gonna be like, what on earth? Index three out of bounds for length three. Valid indexes, zero, one, and two. You start counting at zero. You're a computer scientist. Index three is not valid, right? This array only has three elements, all right? Let's put another value in it just for fun, see what happens. Now it works, right, because I've increased the size of the array. All right, good. Any other questions about this? That was a great question. I, I, I don't wanna, you know, I, I don't wanna overdo the comparisons with Python here. It did seem like a lot of people and had some experience with Python, so I'll try to point out places where there are differences. Obviously, if you haven't programmed before, whatever, that's cool, you know. Um, but those of you that are coming with a little bit of Python background, I'm hoping this is kind of helpful. Okay, so with this great power comes great responsibility, right? We need to be able to figure out how to make sure that the computer will stop running the code that we wrote, all right? So here's an example, let's look at this. So this is very similar to what I just did, right? I've got a variable called index. I continue the loop while it's less than four. There's only one change to this code. What, ha what happens? Yeah, so now if you look, eh, yeah, yeah, we'll see how, let's see how far it got. Yep, yeah. Actually, it got pretty far. There were, <laughs> This, this, this code, within the time I allowed these little playground examples to run, looks like it generated about 250,000 lines of output. It's pretty impressive. Um, but it never stopped, right? So if you run this in our playground, you'll see this error message down here at the bottom, program timed out, right? Because it never left that loop, right? It got in that loop, and it was like, whoo, this is awesome, right? I'm looping around, looping around. I keep waiting for index to get, uh, greater than four, index keeps getting smaller, this is confusing, but whatever, that's what you told me to do, you know? It's computers for you, right? They will unfailingly do the exactly wrong thing as many times as you want. Um, so, so again, we have to make sure when we write, you know, loops that we stop. Here is the ultimate way of writing a loop that never, never terminates. This is called a wild true loop, and these are, these are dangerous. We try to avoid these. I would say whenever you write this, if you ever write a wild true loop, as part of homework problem, as part of your MP that's gonna come out next week, check yourself, right? It's probably wrong, okay? It's probably not the right way to do things. There is a way to get out of this loop, and it is the right thing to do sometimes, but it's not the right thing to do here. Here, 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 okay. So, let me introduce you to another kind of loop. So we looked at a while loop, but the thing that we did before, particularly the thing with the array, right? So this pattern, let me go back to my example. This pattern right here um, is really, really common, right? So essentially, I have an array, and I wanna go through, and I wanna print. Oh, yeah, I took too much out, sorry. So we gotta keep values, we gotta keep index, and then we're just gonna make this less than four, and now I see all the values. So going through an array like this is really, really, really common. And so, in order to support this, you could, so, technically, you don't need any other loops. If you wanna, like, finish this class, writing while loops all the way, again, I wouldn't advise it, but you can, right? You really only need one way to solve this particular problem of having a computer repeat something for you. But, it turns out that this pattern is so common that it has special syntax in Java and in many programming languages. So this is called a for loop. And I start talking about while loops because they're simpler than for loops. Um, but now I want to show you the two side by side so you get a sense. Because for loops are, are quite, the, uh, the syntax, once you get used to it, is a little bit uh, useful and more compact, right? This makes your code more succinct. So up here, you'll see that my while, this common while pattern has three parts. It initializes a variable. It checks whether the variable meets a condition, and it updates the variable at, after the loop finishes. I can write the same thing using this syntax. This is called a for loop. For, another special keyword in the Java programming language, that introduces a for loop declaration. The block of code down here is identical. Those are the instructions you want 
the uh, Java to repeat for you. Inside, this is where things get complicated, particularly if people haven't seen this before or have never seen code before, okay? So let's break it down. There are three parts to this part that is inside the parentheses. They are separated by semicolons. You see there's one semicolon here, there's another semicolon here. So I've got three parts. One, two, three. This part, where I declare my variable, that ended up here. This part where I check the variable, that ends up here. That's the second part. The part where I update the variable, that ended up here. So all of the parts of this very, very common while loop pattern are embodied in the for loop declaration. I declare a variable called index. That variable is only available inside the loop. That's one thing that's important to understand. It is not available outside the loop, so that's a little bit different than a while loop. I have a check that I'm going to examine every time I enter the loop, including the first time. As long as this condition is true, I'm gonna to continue to run the block of code that the loop uh, establishes. And every time I f get back to the top, I'm gonna run this statement, okay? But this is only when I return to the top, not the first time. The first time, index is zero. Then when I get back to the top of the loop, I increment index, and then I check the condition. The condition is still true, I re-enter the loop, okay? So let's rewrite this as a, as, as a, as a for loop. This is what we did before, okay? Um, for int index equals zero, trust me, like, I've written, I don't know. I, you, you kind of wish, after you've been doing this for a while, I wish I had a little counter in my brain that went off every time I hit a for loop. I've probably written like a million of these, okay? Um, not to say that I'm not gonna mess it up in some dumb way. Um, all right, so here's my loop. There it is. Make sure it works. Good. Again, this is one of those things, you know, some of you guys wonder, like, why do I make you write code in the CBTF? You know, don't programmers, like, use the internet when they're writing code? They do. But if you can't write this loop just off the top of your head after a month in this class, then I have failed you because you will have to write this loop so many times in the future. And if you have to look up how to write this loop, every time you do it, you will never make any forward progress and you will get very discouraged, right? So little bits of things like this, we do want you to practice to the point where you're fluent, right? You can just sit down and just bang that out like you've been writing them your entire life. Um, and this is the canonical form of this loop, okay? I have an integer variable called index. It starts at zero, it goes up to some value, and I increment it every time. Why is this so common? Who has a hypothesis? I can write this in other ways. We'll look at some weirder ways of writing for loop, but why is this particular syntax so common? I start the index at zero, I increment it by one every time, I stop when it gets to some value. What am I doing with this loop? That's so common, yeah. Yeah, okay, but, but why, right? Why do I wanna start at index zero and go one by one? What am I doing, yeah? Bingo, I'm going through an array. That's what this loop is for, right? So again, a lot of times you'll see it like this. If I have, let's say I have values is equal to one, oh, check style, two, five, and I do, remember values.length? That helpful property, uh, values. Yeah, this is what this loop is for. It's almost always what for loops are for. One at a time going through the array. And here I'm not using the value in the array, but I can. All right, I can use uh, index to access that value. I start at the beginning, I go to the end. See every single value. I can use this to do a sum. I can use this to do encryption. I can use this to play music, I can use this to analyze DNA, like I can use this loop to process any kind of data that I can store in an array. All right. I'm gonna leave these as an uh, exercise to the reader. Um, these are a little bit weirder loops. I, I, you know, you, you, will, um, you will get tested on some of these, sorry. Uh, they're just, you know, easy to, to set up for the CBTF. We'll have some homework problems on them. This loop can be a little bit more difficult to understand, particularly when you're getting started. So though, here are the things to keep in mind. That initialization, that's the first part, only happens once when I get to the for loop. So when I enter the for loop, that variable that I declare is the first part of my for loop declaration, that happens once. The conditional is executed every single time I enter the loop, including the first time. 
So if that condition is false, I will never execute the for loop and I'll just drop down and keep going, right? The update statement is only performed when I get back to the top of the loop, okay? And it happens before I check the condition. So I update the variable according to that third statement, then I recheck the condition. Condition is still true, back into the loop. All right, so here's roughly your algorithm for thinking about executing in your brain how a for loop is gonna execute. Check the condition, the condition is false, I drop past the block, and I continue executing any other part of the program that's still there. If it's true, execute the loop block. When I get back to the top, update the variable, check the condition again. This is it. So this is your mental model for thinking through how a for loop executes, okay? And again, I can have all sorts of different things here. So here's a weirder version. Here my variable starts at four and I continue until it's less than, while it's less than or equal to eight, and I increment it by two every time. Okay, like I said, this is like a, I'm showing you these for academic interest, but you're not gonna write this very often. This is, this is just not a common way to work with data, right? Um, here's another weird one, right? I start the value at a, at a positive number, I continue while it's greater than or equal to zero, and I decrement it every time. You know, so there, there are cases where I wanna go through and write backwards, and you can figure out how to write the loop to do, the, to do that, right? Again, same thing here. Um, what's gonna happen here? What do you think? So let's, 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 let's process our loop. I have a variable called j, and I initialize it to two. Is j greater than or equal to four? No, I'm done. I never enter the loop. So this is a loop that does not execute. All right, I'm gonna put this up briefly just so you understand it, but I don't have to fill in the different parts of a for loop. If I don't fill them in, they don't get run. So here's a case down here on line eight where the loop is just gonna run forever. There's no variable to declare, no condition to check. Uh, if I, there's no condition to check, the loop will always keep executing, okay? If there's no variable to declare, maybe I declared it outside the loop, right? But again, these are, these are oddities, okay? If you get confused about how a particular for loop is behaving, you might try rewriting as a while loop. Sometimes while loops are easier to understand. Okay, I think I'm out of time today. We will pick up here on Friday. Let me do just a few announcements. Okay, so this is an important one, because you guys have Friday, is today Wednesday? It is. You have Friday left to practice. So on Monday, the class participation scores are gonna start counting for your grade. Okay? You should already be able to view how you're doing at this on our grading page, right? It is not that hard. You have to be here on time, follow along, make sure your computer is connected to the Wi-Fi, and don't leave too early. That's it. Okay, you do that, you'll be golden. We have a couple announcements today. Um, if you didn't get the Lab 1 homework done yesterday, you have another shot. It's available until Sunday. All of the first set of homework problems are due on Sunday. Um, I will see you guys on Friday.